Alright, so we're going to do a session now called Climbing the Agile Testing Ladder. Um, we're going to do this demo in Visual Studio 2013, hot off the press, just installed, and uh, TFS 2013. Uh, well, we're going to be using the cloud. Okay, so you can use this right now if you choose to use the cloud. How many people are using in this room are using TFS? That's what I know the percentage. Hmm, only half. What are you guys using? Git. How many people are using Git? Okay. How many are using Git with TFS for work on tracking? One. Well, that means there's a lot of room for improvement there. You can. So the guys using Git, what are you using for your work on tracking? Redmine. What? Redmine. Redmine. Same. Same. Okay. Redmine. Wow. That sounds like fun. Great. All right. Well, you've got some room for improvement too. All right. So what I'm going to do um, is hopefully uh, focus <coughs> on the testing story. And there's lots of solutions out there, but I want to ramp up the way that you do testing. We want to ramp it up from just sending, just doing manual testing and sending emails, okay? Which is where a lot of people are at. How many people are at that their testers send emails? Okay. Um, how many people are doing test cases and test steps? Okay, what are you guys doing? How do your testers work? Black box. What's black box mean? Well, go out and see if it works. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just the manual testing. Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay, how many people here have automated tests that run over the UI? Okay, we got got four. What are you using for that? Selenium. Selenium? 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 Selenium and QTP. Selenium and QTP, great. All right, that's great. So Selenium's uh, getting some traction in Sydney. That's great. All right, awesome. So let's um, talk about the history of where testing has been. So in 1990 and before, we just built Exis and our testers sent emails. In 2000, um, Automated QA was uh, released as Test Complete, Automated QA Test Complete. Um, and then in 2001, Mercury Interactive um, had this Quick Test Professional and it was quite popular. It's now been purchased by HP. 2002, um, IBM uh, Robot was released and that's now called uh, IBM Rational Functional Tester and it's quite popular. 2005, Microsoft jumped in the game usual, as usual a few years late and they tried to um, jump in with this test edition and it was pretty hopeless, okay, compared with the competition. Didn't even rank on the surveys. So in 2006, HP acquires Mercury uh, they got a spending <coughs> spree of $4.5 billion and they ended up with HP Quality Center and QTP, um, which is called uh, HP Unified Functional Tester. Do you like that name? HP Unified Functional Tester, UFT. And it's a big fat ActiveX control in a web page. It looks pretty ugly. It runs on VB script, but it's loved by testers. Um, 2007, Smart Bear go and acquire Automated QA with Test Complete as being the product that they wanted. 2008, Microsoft um, tried to catch up and as usual, um, version two is um, uh, got some improvements, but it's not really there. They focused on this web <coughs> testing thing that they had because web was getting more popular. And rather than just record the entire thing with a, a web test, they um, uh, supported Fiddler so that you could just take the bits that you wanted rather than the whole kit and caboodle. So that was quite good. 2008, this little baby company um, released something, uh, Art of Test, and the reason that they released something was because the problem with the web test was they didn't support Ajax. They didn't look at that. They just looked at the HTTP traffic and that was it. So this little company then got acquired by Telerik and it became Telerik Test Studio. Uh, we use that a lot along with um, some of these other things, mainly the Visual Studio story. But then 2010 Microsoft released um, Microsoft Test Manager. And this was a big deal. This was the first time that they were seriously taking on HP and IBM. And that's where we really started um, getting teams up and running on this. 
Uh, but really, it's just a, a <coughs> fancy test case management system. It didn't do heaps or um, beautifully. It had coded UI tests, which um, Damo will take us through. And then 2011, Microsoft finally, with this, they made it into the Gardner's Magic uh, Quadrant. Uh, they were already in there for ALM, but now they jumped in there for the um, testing, the testing suites. So um, that's called Software QA. Then, 2012, sorry for the long history lesson, but Telerik released this load and performance testing, so they jumped into that space. Um, and they also released Test Duty for iOS, which is just an iPhone app. And then in 2012, uh, MTM exploratory testing um, is released and there's heaps of <coughs> UI improvements are centered around just doing exploratory ad hoc testing. 2013, Telerik uh, move into the Gardener Magic Quadrant, um, which has only happened in the last week. I just got um, <coughs> an email from Microsoft which had the Gardener um, image in it. And, uh, there's no sign of load and performance testing in the cloud, which is what people really want. Okay, so uh, the Telerik story there hopefully is going to get more complete, but it's not there at the moment for the load testing story. So we don't um, take that, that one, we don't use that, that side, but we do use the other part. 2013, um, a good chunk of MTM moves into the web when, because they've just released their preview and that uh, seems to be the direction. TFS releases a preview of their load and performance testing, and that's great news. So you can do load testing without any infrastructure at all, apart from just logging onto Azure and say, smash my server. And um, 2013, Microsoft moves into uh, number three position uh, for the magic quadrant, okay? So they're now number three. Number one is HP. Number two, IBM, Microsoft number three. And they're going up quite quickly. Now, I uh, will tell you that HP is still number one, still ActiveX, still VB Script, and still fairly expensive. But I think what you'll be impressed about is even though Microsoft is sitting at number three, I'm going to explain to you why they're... Um, look, I'm, I'm completely tainted because I spend most of my time with the Microsoft tools and the Telerik tools, and that's kind of how my history is, is slanted here. But I honestly think that you can look at Microsoft of having the best testing tools, even though they're number three, and I'll tell you why in a sec. But first of all, let's look at the cost, because none of this stuff is cheap. Um, HP stuff, it's $8,000 a user. The Smart Bear stuff, the test complete, all good. Five grand a user. The test stuff is two grand a user. Now, I know you can get all this cheaper. Um, I don't think anyone pays retail for Microsoft software or probably for the other stuff, and it's hard to actually get the prices off. It's, it's pretty hard. Anybody, did you have a comment? No. No. Right, so, um, Anyone know that no more exact pricing than that? No. All right. So anyway, the Microsoft stuff is cheaper, but it's still not as cheap as um, you would hope. So let's look at the magic quadrant and see if I can convince you of how the story is changing here. 2009, you can see HP and IBM are in the leaders and they're the ability to execute. So they're looking really strong. And then you look for Microsoft in this story, and they weren't in the story because Test Manager had not been released. Okay, but um, is there any other ones you guys are looking at here? So Automated QA is down here. Yep, no? Cool. So, if you look here, you can now see today, and this has just been released in the last um, few days, HP, IBM, and Microsoft are up here. Okay, there's a few others, but they're the ones that really matter. I found this really interesting. Smart Bear is another one that works with Microsoft stuff. And the Telerik stuff, which I was, I smiled when I saw that, I expected it to come in. That's put, they're, they're down there as a leader, but they're pinged, they're pinged, you know, they're pegged to the bottom essentially because they're seen as not a high ability to execute because they're a small company. Okay? So anyway, they're the ones I'm watching because the only ones that work with Microsoft stuff in this list is Smart Bear and Telerik, uh, uh, or just use Microsoft stuff. But they're the ones I, I'm looking at. Now I told you they're number three, but in my eyes they're number one, and I'll tell you why. Because when you look at the ALM story, the ALM story has Microsoft at the top. 
we are the, at the top of the ALM story. Now, the test stuff works with in the ALM suite. When you look at the other ones, like HP, their testing stuff is essentially, they say, we've got a great testing story, but it's in a silo. It's, you know, the testers don't work with the developers. They essentially say, throw them over this big wall, and now the testing division works. Now, I'm not interested in that because I'm a heavy scrum guy, and so there's no such role as a tester. A tester is on the team, and we work together, devs and testers together. So, I wouldn't consider strongly a tool that won't work with the developers. And that's my, that would be my argument to you or for you guys to consider this when you're talking to your clients. You can't just look at the best testing tool. The testing tool must work You know, if you care about the whole ALM story. It's got to work together. All right, so anyway, let's talk about the tools we're going to talk about tonight. And that is going to be this thing, which is called MTM. And uh, I'll take you through the bits I like and don't like, and then we'll talk about the web portal. Okay, this is the brand new web portal. So, just a little bit about us. Uh, we're at SSW here. Um, we do mainly consulting, and uh, a lot of the comments you'll hear from uh, Damo and us tonight is what we see um, out there. Uh, I am a Microsoft Regional Director and an ALM MVP. I got uh, MVP of the year in 2011. Damo? Me, so I run the Brisbane office, so I'm just down here in a little junket. Um, as of this morning, I'm also the mayor of SSW Sydney on um, Foursquare, so obviously none of these guys use that. Um, Damo, <laughs> uh, we don't use Foursquare in Sydney. We've all moved to Instagram. <laughs> it's Instagram, yeah. It's, uh, I'll post I need to do my Foursquare post with a nice filter. And anyway, so a lot of the stuff I do, I do a lot of TFS and a lot of Scrum. Um, and then I'm also a web guy, so MVC. You'll probably see that come across with some of the demos as well. A lot of my testing stuff is testing with the web. So I'm um, a big fan of ASP.NET MVC and uh, HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, all of that good stuff. Cool. So here is our agenda. We're going to take you through something that I care about, which is the agile testing space. Uh, we'll talk about exploratory testing, code UI tests, Test management, <coughs> stakeholder feedback, and lab management. Okay, and I'll make sure Damo does a little bit for you, Slanning guys. Okay, all right. You hear that one? Yeah. All right. Yep. Good. Cool. Okay. So agile testing. What does Scrum say about testing? Does anyone know? So it says in the Scrum guide, development teams do not contain sub teams dedicated to particular domains like testing or business analysis, etc. There, no such thing. They also have in the definition of done, each increment is additive to all prior increments and thoroughly tested. You cannot finish a sprint and say, we've done all the coding, uh, we're waiting on the testers to test. No such thing in Scrum. Okay, it's gotta be done and tested and it's really hard. It's really hard. It means you have to have a tester on the team who's diligent and is you know, working well with the dev guys. All right, so why do we care um, about, what, what things should we care about in terms of Agile? Uh, this is a reminder, inter individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We care about working software over comprehensive docu documentation, which means we don't follow the test steps and test plans of what we created, you know, you know two weeks ago, let alone six months ago when the document was written, okay? We worry about what's happening now. Customer collaboration over negotiation and responding to change. So what does that mean for testing? Well, we've got to um, make team communications real easy. Make testing easy and test that the feature works. I don't care what a certain thing in the technical specs say. Um, that is a bad way of kind of running a test team. Because uh, we're... And actually, I just went and worked at a company, it was, and it was quite, uh, the, the, it, it was a silent approach. They did say they were doing Scrum, but they clearly weren't doing Scrum. When they sat down and they saw a, an error, and the dev could have fixed it there and then, there was, I saw the dev and the tester doing, they have these uh, little over-the-shoulder meetings, which were really nice. Um, but they have a process, and, and 
In fact, the dev wouldn't make the change until it was documented, because he's obviously been in trouble before for something. And so now the tester has to go back and say, can you change the width of that column, rather than just change it there and then and not worry about the documentation and stuff like that. So it's, um, I would, as a developer, not do any work until I had acceptance criteria. The acceptance criteria ends up being very important for the tester as well. So we, um, the other thing is you want to somehow give stakeholders a really nice way or somehow encourage them to give feedback early and often, you know, um, and that's not a person on the team, that's just people that are interested, subject matter experts that should be doing it, but sometimes they're going to be pretty hopeless at giving feedback. They're going to be n hopeless at sending emails with lots of details in, and then you've got a new problem. We've got to now put that in the system and there's all this friction all the time. So we want to talk about those things. I spent a lot of time, some time ago, writing rules to better user acceptance tests and all these different um, rules about it. And I'll take you through a couple of those tonight. So different types of testings, what are they? What are the different types of testing? You can yell them out to me. Sorry, unit? What's system testing? System testing is nothing but uh, before integration, the, the team, the development team by itself uh, does it uh, to see if it all works together. So, so is system testing done by a tester? Okay. Tester within the development team. Right, okay, all right. The integration testing is all systems working together with team by um, all right, I'm going to push back on those definitions because I, uh, I think most people would consider an integration test an automated piece of code that did it. Um, and in terms of your system testing, I'd break that down into two types. There's manual testing, where the person just goes on and they start <coughs> testing the things that are, they're essentially told to do. You know, open this form, click this button, check that you can see the balance, then enter product X put two and two and check the total is four. That I call that manual testing. And I, the other part of <coughs> break it down is to in automated testing. So when they have that and it automatically <coughs> tests. Any other, any other types of tests you guys would consider? Performance. Performance tests, very important. Okay, and how do you do a performance test? Performance testing tools. Performance testing tools typically uh, show you the fat methods of something that's slow. But performance testing itself can be done just even with a unit test, or you know, well, I should call it an integration test now because it's testing multiple layers. But um, you want to say that I should be able to call these, <coughs> this process and it should happen within two seconds or it fails that. And at that point in time, you use performance testing tools to break that down. Right? Is that right? Cool. So, um, the other, there's one other a very important type of test. Acceptance criteria testing? Um, so, how does acceptance criteria testing differ from manual tests? Well, uh, only in that the thing you would manually be testing for would have been set by the client rather than by the developer or the team. Okay. So, <coughs> alright, let me push back on that a little. I would generally consider that the acceptance test, the acceptance criteria, that that is what the customer tells you, so yes, I agree. Um, but that is then broken down to test cases and test steps. Um, or you can throw that out the window and say, look, you're an intelligent guy, that's my acceptance criteria, just go ahead and start testing and see if it passes. I don't need to tell you the exact places to click and all that type of stuff. Load, load testing. Thank you. What about load testing? And I tell you what, I'm very sensitive to load tests. Um, I have uh, incurred a considerable amount of pain over my career because uh, things that work beautifully when put to the test and a site absolutely smashed. I can tell you one customer of ours um, uh, insisted on us going live on the day of their biggest sale. And uh, that was not uh, not pleasant. Uh, it doesn't sound very logical. You're going to wonder why I agreed. Well, first of all, I never agreed. <laughs> but uh, secondly, the old site crashed 
under load all the time so they thought well the new site must be better it, it must it'll probably crash less we'll just take the chance well that's not that's not the best time to, um, to do it unless you're going to do load testing before yes perfect example of that <coughs> is Maxis when they released SimCity mm. obviously they didn't do load testing everything crashed and nobody could play a game that they paid for wow okay cool <coughs> So uh, we, these days, in the last few years, we set up, uh, uh, as part of the build, very early on, we set up uh, a load test that runs every night and uh, shows you, it, it has a graph, and that can show you if you inserted some code that is slow performing. Um, that, because you don't want something that can break, the easiest way to do that is just um, load test the services because that's not gonna change as much as UI, okay? Because UI is painful. All right, so here's the different types of tests, unit tests, integration tests, and I'm gonna break those ones down into a few. There's coded integration tests, like you could call them you know, <coughs> big fat unit tests, okay? That's a bad, bad term, but coded. Um, coded UI test, which is a UI one, and Selenium, which is essentially a UI test as well, okay? All right, and Selenium only works with the web, We've then got performance tests and load tests. All right, and these are what devs care about. We covered it all? And what about full end-to-end -end system testing, which is not just the, the technology, but also the surrounding processes, which are less important. Full end-to-end -end system testing. Um, well, I can tell you that uh, that really often can only be done in production because it's very hard especially if you're talking about uh, you know all the firewalls and all the other complexities of a company sometimes you cannot create an environment that tests every single bit it's almost <coughs> impossible um, you can get pretty close with lab manager and now you can have the same software and, and hardware set up but the exact environment sometimes almost impossible yes our company does have a staging environment where in which we make it mandatory for everything before every release we ensure that the whole end-to-end -end, uh, system has been tested every bit of pieces of software has been tested at least once every part will be tested uh, before we actually go live but is that environment inside the same network yeah yes okay and, and when you say completely tested is that manually tested or automated test Big, big bits of uh, both. Both. Yeah. Okay. TJ. So for, for some of the enterprises, we actually deploy in the production, but we do not make it live. So it's made live to, let's say, at first 500 people, yes. then to 2,000, then yes. 4,000, then you reach your whatever your yes. final number is. But we do it in steps. Yeah. We yes. find that that works better yeah. instead of 20,000 people trying to use it. And that is the better way of, of doing that, um, to, to deploy to small percentages and ever increasing. That uh, requires a certain level of maturity well beyond almost all teams. Okay, but that is a good way of doing it. Um, especially um, if you've got the one database and that requires different, um, you know, there's different fields now have been introduced but you still got the one database. It's very hard to uh, do that unless there's very good planning involved in doing it. All right, I'm trying to get you from manual tests tonight to you know uh, a, a higher level of maturity for testing but yes you can go really high okay so these are the tests that devs think about if you're a tester you would have mentioned a few others okay and that's smoke tests manual tests and organized manual tests which is from the acceptance criteria you end up with user acceptance tests which turn into test cases then test steps and all the other stuff all right, and then we have the automated test, which is where we would love to get to, and then we don't have to do too much manual work. All right, you with me? All right, so if I was to drill in just to this one, the user acceptance test, I'd just like to drill into that one. You can start with manual testing, and that's exploratory testing. Um, and you kind of look at this from black box here, right the way over to this one, which is white box, when you're looking inside this system and you unit test a white box because you know what you're looking at. This is, I don't know what's inside, I'm just testing it, okay? So you can certainly do tests here that you can't do on this side. 
So we've got manual testing, organized manual testing when you're doing the test cases and test steps. And then you've got the automated testing with code UI tests and Selenium tests, and then down to the developer level. Now, I this part um, is the area I see most mostly. Okay, and this part I want to improve tonight because it's the area that a lot of people spend a lot of time and they do, they do it in my eyes fairly inefficiently. They, all right, so this, you tell me if this is what you see, but I see most companies out there 70 to 80 percent are spending a lot of, most of their effort in that area. There is a smaller percentage that are quite organized with their testers. Their testers are pretty smart people and they're they're organized, they are trying to have nice systems, test cases, test steps, and things like that. Then, uh, I'm still sad about this, but most companies I go into, you don't see more than, you don't see any, any unit tests. And when I say don't see any, when I look at the code coverage stats, I don't see more than a, a handful of tests. You know, I, I certainly see under 10% of unit tests, uh, under 5%, sometimes under just a few percent. They've just they've had a go at unit testing, but they're not they're not following it. They're not they're not sold on it, or it's just too busy. They're just too busy. Then you've got this automated testing, the UI testing, and in most cases, I would say most companies are dreaming. They're just trying to. They want to get there, but they've just got too many other things to worry about. They can't even do the other things, so it's too far away. All right, is that similar to what you guys are seeing? Yeah. All right, so let me, in, let me introduce to you the professional testing tool, which is Microsoft Test Manager, and then I want to go a little beyond that. How many people are using this today? No one. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So, um, what I want to do is I want to show you that you can create a test plan, test, test, a test suite, test, test, test steps, run tests. All right. But what you'll see, rather than me go through all this, is there's a lot of steps here. And I think in the end, it's not massive value that you get out of this. Um, you know the problem I have with this is it's not, it's not teaching tests, it's not telling, it gives the wrong signal to a tester. Just do what exactly what it says. It says, click this URL and click the button and then do this and then do that. They're certainly never going to be become expected to be user experience experts. Is this a nice user experience? Because they're just trying to follow, they're, they're like a, a robot, okay? Um, I, I, had a, I heard a funny expression this week by my daughter actually. We went to a funeral for my uncle. It's very sad. And he was very old and he'd outlived most of his family. And, um, but his, his kids were there but they were very old people too now. And uh, he, uh, he didn't have anyone speak for him. He had the person that was run, runs the funeral parlor. What's their name? Whatever. Anyway, that funeral parlor girl. And she said, you know, Douglas, um, he was very loved over his life and this. And when we got in the car, my daughter said, she's 10, and she said, um, Dad, it was very sad that his children didn't speak. Why, why did that happen? I said, oh, I don't know, maybe they didn't feel comfortable. You know, the lady that was speaking, it was like a robot set to sad. <laughs> I just thought it was a cute expression. So, anyway. So, anyway, I don't want to encourage testers to become robots. So, here we go. Exploratory testing. And this is the cool thing. This is the area that nails this manual testing and the organized manual testing. So, this one... This one tool can cover 80 to 100 percent of customers out there to improve the maturity from where they are to the next level. This is not where you want to be in the end, but this is a good first step. So let's have a look at that. So humans are smart, mostly. <coughs> and I have come across a few testers that aren't too smart and developers. Um, how do you capture? How do you force them? How do you capture force them? Is that? See, even ah, even my the poor testing, that's the problem. How do you <laughs> force them to give you good bug reports, okay? You have testing, all right? Now I'm doing live testing here in front of you. That's why there's errors, okay. So, do you guys have a system how you do this? 
how do you guys encourage your users to give you good bug reports <coughs> so you can repro the thing and etc. I'm just curious. Do you shouting. have huh? shouting? Shouting. Yeah, but do you give them directives of things you want them to do? Does anyone say you must give me a repro step or you must give me a screen capture or you must do something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. capture yeah. logs. You want to capture log? How do they do that? Uh, well, we, we, have, we get them to, to load up the log of, if it, it's been a fishy log, log or screenshot. You want the text file log that was stored when they hit a bug? Yeah. Okay, cool. Why, do you, why don't you just have some code that automatically submits that? Oh, it does. Oh, it does those well? You can submit it. Too. Okay, cool. Yes? So we use QC. Uh, QC, yep. Yeah. yeah. So that has some mandatory uh, fees that have to be filled in. Yes. Uh, before you submit a bug. So that actually. Yes. So he's got mandatory fields that you have to fill in in QC. And the mere fact he's using QC means he's a few levels of maturity above most companies. Any others? Things they really want their testers to do? Got, um, we have a tool for. Uh, doing screen capture as you're doing it. If you hit something, you can snapshot it and draw on it. Right, so you, you get them to use some screen capture tool to do. Yes. Uh, my, my people use OneNote. OneNote, you get them to use OneNote. Is that good or bad? I Is that know. so you can see? Well, I, I want to be able to see, and they, they have, they're told to take a screenshot, as many screenshots as you need, and describe how you got to this and what you're pressing. Right. And, and then get any errors and so on and so forth. Well, OneNote is good because it's a rich tool. And I can and, interact and with it. OneNote and OneNote is also good because you can open that on your iPad or open that on another machine. You're seeing what they're doing. So it's a good way. It's very similar to just email, really. Yes. To a degree. Okay, except you've got a big document. You don't have to press send. All right, so one of the problems is when they do it with even OneNote, when they've hit a bug, now they've got to write down those steps that trigger them to hit the bug. And sometimes the developer will say, well, but I did what you told me and it works on my machine. How many okay. developers does it take to change a light bulb? None, it works here. Mm. Right, okay, good. So the tester says, it's working now. Um, what did you do? And the developer says, I actually didn't change anything. You just can't remember the steps you did. That type of stuff, all right? Um, so here is your answer. MTM exploratory testing. And, um, all right, if, if, uh, sorry, the guy at the back, if, you, if someone gets stuck, if you could just open that door, that'd be good. So, all right, so let's, um, let me just take you through how I'm gonna demo this. You have acceptance criteria, you have unplanned testing, you capture the steps, and then the tester must remember to do these. The tester must remember, their job is to find bugs and, and log bugs. And when they log the bugs, they really should be, you should be aiming for them to go another level of maturity above just sending you bug reports. They should then be creating test cases so that same bug doesn't happen in the future. Nobody cares about a bug, but they really care when the same one keeps coming back. You know, do that a few times and people will think you're unreliable, you lose your job. All right, now Damien, Damo, how about um, I be your demo monkey and you'll take me through this. All right. Okay. So your first point there, acceptance criteria, that's the most important thing, really. So when you're testing this stuff, you need to know what you're going to test, obviously. So the acceptance criteria field in your work items is, or in your PBI is really what you want. So Adam's just logging into TFS on the cloud, visualstudio.com. All right. And I will log in here. Right. I'm going to look over your shoulder. This okay. is testing as well. All right, cool. Now, I actually don't know the exact thing that he's going to take me through here, but... So that's that's our project, yep. Fabricam Fiber. So what we want to make sure is that we're on Sprint 3 at the moment, which you can see. So I'll click this guy. Uh, go to Sprint 3. Sure. Yep, there you go. So let's, let's do a test for that first item there, that reporting for statistics that you can see. Okay. So first thing we want to do is make sure that there is acceptance criteria because so you need to know what, what to test. So all right, so I'm a tester, I'll pretend I'm the tester. Okay, do I look like a tester? I am a tester because I don't know what I'm, what I'm about to test. I'm going to be reporting for statistics. And well, I'd say to you, Damon, the first thing is I wouldn't start programming if, if I was a developer because mm -hmm. you haven't given me acceptance criteria. All right, 
Is that, so, a, is that a test for me or is that a fail for you? No, it's a, <laughs> that's a uh, proving that you need acceptance criteria. Okay. So we'll add acceptance criteria. Let's Good. say uh, navigating to the reports page shows you statistics for the last month. Reports page will show stats for the last month by default. Okay? Yep. Cool. That's it? Let's leave it at that. Yep. Done. Now I'd co go ahead and do that, and then I would essentially say it's now done. Yeah, so that one's ready to test. So uh, where's my um, state? State. Uh, that is done. We, do you know what I would do? I would change this, and I'm going... Do you mind if I just customise this so it has a, a test step? In the, uh, yeah, sure. So yeah. I'll just go to the board. So let me just hang on a sec here. You've got a couple of stages here, and I don't know what you guys... <laughs> care about, but you've got to do, in progress and done. I'm going to encourage you to adopt some Kanban habits. So Adam, this yes. is your task for this sprint. So what you want to do is do the board on the backlog. Okay, all right. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, I'll do it there, but I could do it here as well. Okay. Yeah, I could. Uh, oh no, there's no customizer. Right, you're right. Okay, so I'm just going to go to the backlog and I'm going to show you that you've got new, approved, committed, and done. Before done, if you're a scrum guy, this must be done and tested. So we could rename that to done and tested, or we could or we could put an extra stage here because the problem with done and tested is a developer might try to test their own stuff. And that's never a good idea. So we come in here. I'll just add an extra stage in here. See in here, I'm gonna press that. And I'm gonna call this ready, for test and because this I'm very sensitive about this because the cost of fixing a bug is dependent upon how long it took to be reported so if you keep that low then you'll do your work get testing quick and then the it'll still be in your RAM and then you'll fix it quicker rather than days later so you'll see that says to that that's the whip limit so if I move this into here, oh gee, TJ's getting excited, he loves Kanban. So these ones, where's the one, uh, that, that's the one that I should be working on, this guy. And if I was to move another one in here, what do you notice? Great, what did you notice? Ready for test, is that red? Very good, your eyes are great for someone at your, your age. That's very kind of you, yes. <laughs> and you can see this one is three, and it's in red too. So that tells me, that I, the, the devs need to come off their coding and they need to start working hard on this to get this down part under the whip limit. Or we can you know, take one back. All right, now everything's uh, not red again. All right, anyway, let me go, let me continue. All right, back so, to you. so this is ready to test now. Yes. Right. So yes. You're, you being a tester, you start up MTM. Okay, so I'll start MTM. So I'm just gonna, um, come here, uh, I'll just type test. There it is, Microsoft Test Manager. <coughs> okay, and I'm gonna jump into the same thing. And uh, what was it called? SSW.demo.fabricand Great, done. So I'm in, I'm now the tester doing this, and I'm going to use this great testing environment. And we're going to be walking through test steps. Oh, we have um, a, um, a plan per sprint. So sprint three, sprint four, sprint five. Right. So what we want to do is we want to do an exploratory test on that work item, on that product backlog item. Now that's not in this test plan at the moment, um, which is my fault again, because I only just added it. So we want to add that requirement to this test plan that we've got. So can you add a requirement, Adam? Uh, yes, I will add that guy. Uh, so you, you put each PBI on that list. I always wish this was a dialogue, but um, anyway, uh, I, I will need to find that one that I've just done. So it's if you've just added it, it might be, no? At the end. There we go. Add requirements. So this list has each one of my PBIs. And each one is going to be have an exploratory test. 
So traditionally you'd set up test cases for that and the test suite and uh, they'd all have test steps, but we want to be a bit more agile. You know, things might have changed since we did this document six months ago, so we'll just do an exploratory test, but on that work item. Okay. So if you right click on that work item, you can explore that requirement. It should have flashing lights on it because this is the key feature. See this thing is very, very cool. Now, what, before I continue on, you could do this another way by clicking on test. And they wanted you to click on that button so much that they came here and they put a menu, the weirdest menu in the world, do exploratory testing. Is that a normal menu item to have? Because really it's just inside the run test. Do exploratory testing. I think that's a weird word to put. Anyway, we'll come, we'll come back. I'll, I'll just um, <coughs> come back to my planning. I'll do it the way Damo suggested. Explore, explore. Why don't they have that right click menu? Do exploratory testing again. Isn't that inconsistent? Um, anyway, so we're gonna start that test. Yes. Now I am going to. I'm a tester now, so I'm just going to press start, but I'm not really sure what I'm meant to be testing at this point in time. Um, so I would need to click <coughs> that guy. Oh, and it goes, so I'm the tester, I couldn't remember what it was, but here it is. The acceptance criteria, by the way, that's not very obvious, is it? But um, navigating to the reports page will show stats for last month. Oh, okay. All right, so I'll open it up. So let's do that. I can. I think I can remember that guy. All right, what's the URL? So the URL is vs two thousand thirteen dash ssw dot cloud app dot net. Okay, cool. And uh, what do I have to do? I've forgotten already. <laughs> uh, navigate to the reports page, and it'll show stats for last month. Okay, so I'll click on reports. And I've got to see stats for last month. Um, hey, I just saw an error. Is there, am I meant to see that? Well, in this Oof. demo, yes. But oh, good. No, All right. No, so you're not supposed to see errors in general. Okay, so that's not very good. No. I am, I'm going to use some of these tools as a tester. And I'm going to say, that can't be good. Now, I like Snagit actually, but I'm not using Snagit. But you're not going to believe this. TJ, you're a smart guy. I want to annotate this. I want to put a circle on that sorry because I don't like it. How do you think I edit this thing? Right click and say open it. No, no right click, no right click menu. Can you believe that? Wow. You just have to be smart enough to know double click. Oh. Is that ridiculous? Anyway, so while I'm doing this, it's it's pause the test because is that paint? Uh, this paint. is paint, yes. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty advanced. You can set this up so it uses something better. But I there we go. It's pretty cool. We'll close that. I'll save changes and it goes back here. And you see the resume restarts. Because why does it need to pause it while I'm doing that? In case you needed to record the time it took to get to that point. No, that it's because when the um, <coughs> developer sees this bug report, rather than ask the tester all the different things that happened, he will... Um, just have a look at what that person did, exactly what the person did. And obviously we don't need to know the person was editing an image. All right. All right. So, so, so now you've found a bug. You've yes. annotated it, you've given a screenshot, you want to create a bug, right? Yep, I do. So if you click the big create bug icon, which is a little bit cut off on the projector. But so uh, I want to say... So the bug might be... Bug in the reports page. Is that what you want? Yep, that sounds good. Great. If you have a look down in the steps to reproduce, Oops. this is where that gap disappears, where the, the tester doesn't need to remember what he did anymore, because everything that you've done... It shows you where you were clicking. Yep. Everything. Everything. But you don't want everything. That's actually got some stuff from you know a little while ago, actually. So. You want to change those steps just to parse it down to the stuff that's relevant. You know, right. if, you, if you've been clicking around for 45 minutes, you don't want 45 minutes of steps. You want this. So, TJ, how do, I, how do I get rid of step two? Delete. Hit delete button. You could do it like that. There's a better way. 
right click cut. See this change <laughs> steps. If you read the instructions, nobody reads them. To change, the <laughs> click change steps. <coughs> Here we go. I still think delete button will be best. Well, you can just say that I want just those ones, and those three signify what was important. So, you know, when you do an email, you make an email concise and to the point. You're doing the same thing here. And you press select. There's those three, just those three. Just a question, instead of screenshots, can you do movie captures? And that's a good question. So instead of a screenshot, can you do a movie capture? Because that would be more let's, lighting. So let's Hang continue on. with this one first. We might, be able to, <laughs> we might be able to. I'm actually not 100% sure on this one. But. So, all right, so we've got a bug here. You're happy with that bug report? It's got everything you need in it. So I'm going to go, I could go save and close and that's going to save my bug. But what would a good tester do? <coughs> Set up a test such that the next person can repeat that test next month when it's repaired yes. and ensure that this does not happen. Oh, you're spot on, Grant. All right, that's good. So let's um, do that. You go save and create a test. So it saved the bug and then it creates a test. And if you looked at the top here, it says new test case. So what do you want to say here? So this test case would be uh, navigating to the report page shows the default report, maybe. How about that? Now we go to the report page sh uh, shows. Well, actually you're just describing the, the, the the description of the test that you're trying to perform is the test. So it is make sure that the default report appears when you open. So in this case, it kind of matches one to one with that product backlog yeah. item. But your product backlog item could be something like, uh, you know, we want to implement Active Directory authentication on this site. And when the test is testing through, you might say, yeah, that's all working, that's fine, but this page here should have been locked down. It's in the requirements somewhere, you know, it should be locked down. So that test case will now be, this page is locked for Active Directory login, or something like that. So in this case, it's a bit trivial, but. Additionally, can I ask, because it said, sorry, something did, something, something didn't happen, yep. did that record like a stack trace somewhere? And can this tester thing go and get that? Because that's really what the, that's really think, what the I tester think so wants. There, there was a link there. So let, let us show you. That? You want to know what additional information was stored to help right. the developer. Right. Hold on. Well, actually, in this case, it's showing the wrong page. It's showing the profile page, right? Yeah, because was the profile page, wasn't it? Um, no, that, that, that is the report page. Well, so that's the report. I clicked on the report yeah, page. That is the correct page to do. reports, that's the profile. It should show up the statistics. All right, okay, we're not going to. Yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> this app <laughs> itself could be okay. improved. We're just trying to show the steps. Okay, so right. Okay. <laughs> this so is a sample Microsoft app. So, this test case, if you want to have a look at the other stuff that's in there, we've got the actions, but if you just click on the links section there, so we can see already it's linked back to that product backlog item and it's linked to the bug. But as well as that, up above it, there's a test result, exploratory test started on whatever. So you can actually drill into that exploratory test recording and see everything that that person did, that actual test session, you know, how long it took, who did it, all that sort of stuff as well. There's also... Um, Does it change the status on your Kanban board? Of the product backlog item? Big question. Does it change the status of your product backlog item on the Kanban board? board? Let's go and have a look at it in a sec. Yeah. So be uh, you done with this? Yep. So, so I, I just wanted to show you that the next tester that comes along and is about to start testing on this um, test case will be able to look here and see that there is a bug and it hasn't been fixed. Okay. So they, they know quite a bit. Save and close. Yep. Save and close that one. All right. So we're we're pretty much done. There, what we've got, and you can see the little log there. Um, All right, if you drag that across. It's a little bit cut off on the on the um, projector, but there's a bug created and a test case created. So just from this exploratory testing, we've got stuff that is actionable. We've got this bug that a developer can fix, and they have all the links to the history and the screenshots and the step steps. 
And we've got a test case, which means the testers don't have to try and remember what they did last time. They've got a physical test case with detailed steps and they can see exactly what they did. So here's how you change the screenshot to a different um, tool. And uh, <coughs> you can also have your default audio device, so it's recording everything you're speaking about. Um, and you can turn on uh, desktop screen sharing, which basically records everything that you're doing, like a movie of it. Okay. And uh, you can turn on sound by clicking that, and that would record your voice. Okay. Well, one thing that I will mention as well, the um, exploratory test and by testing by default only records your last 10 things that you did. You can change this in a config file in MTM though. So there's an mtm.exe.config with a setting the same. This is how many I record by default. So good idea if you're spending a lot of time and things are very complex. All right, cool. So we're finished? We're finished, so let's end that's, that testing. That's the end of my exploratory testing. Okay. So um, what did you guys think of that? Is that a, who thinks that's a good way to have testers report or test certain features? Okay, that uh, looks like 95%. Yeah, yeah. Who's not sold on the tool? Okay, all right, cool, that's good, zero. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, that is better than I expected. All right, so you all like it. It's, it's I, I like it, but I didn't know if you guys would. So we'll back, back to, to the slides. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we we looked at what was involved. They could see the acceptance <coughs> criteria. They could do some testing that used their brain. Um, they it captured the steps when they hit a problem, and not only that, it encouraged them to do a bug report and the test case to stop it happening in the future. I thought that was great. Um, so there's the acceptance criteria. You come through here, you have, well, I don't know how you guys do it, but have a, a plan per sprint. Um, you explore each PBI, and you can come into do exploratory testing and press explore. And then you start doing it using this MTM tool, Microsoft Test Manager. Um, you come over here, you create the bug, you'll see the you can modify which steps you want to report and um, and then the developer knows exactly what you did without you even having to explain the repro steps. No more testers explain repro steps which is a lot of friction. Okay, save and create test. I love that. It's, I think it's really good practice. And the test steps are automatically populated. You modify those if they're not what you want and then you, you're done. And that is the end of your session. So the summary, you liked it. Um, there's no need for detailed test steps um, until there's a problem. You have the bugs. There's, it's very hard to create a bug, bad bug report with this. Very hard. You know, This removes the division that testers and devs have had for a long time. Working in silos, this um, really removes a lot of that friction. Um, test cases um, have been automatically set up for repeatability with um, good steps. Now, if you do it this way, you're past 80% of customers that I see. So um, that is a good way of improving your team. But there's a better way. There's a better way still, even though that's awesome. And uh, I am going to let you drive here. I'm going to steal this one. So this is a continuation. Kind of. So we've got our test, our testers go through, they do all their testing and so on, but you can create a coded UI test from a recording, from one of those test recordings, so that the testers not only have this thing that's repeatable, but they can actually do it without any manual interaction. So you've automated this test that you've created. Uh, these tests will actually add to your code coverage, which can be a little bit tricky to get going, but once you do, you know, you have much more code coverage over your project. Um, and the whole aim here is to get your devs and your testers to work together. The testers are good at working out test cases and working out what's wrong and finding bugs. The devs are good at automating stuff. So, you know, they work together. It saves times for the te saves saves time for the testers, and they you know get a lot more a lot more benefit in both sides of the table. So, I'm going to switch back to the VM here. I'm going to try to switch back to the VM here.
interesting. <laughs> oh, right. I'll just open the VM again. So a little bit of trivia, we've got this ad hoc VM running in Azure. So before we start, we it's shut down and afterwards we spin it back up again. And if we have a network connection, it works <coughs> fantastically. And that would be your problem. And that has done climbing. Again, all right. So developers, right? They don't they don't like MTM. And you get a developer to start up MTM, and they'll look at you with a strange expression. Why would they use something like that? So, um, I want to open Visual Studio. So I'm a developer. Don't want this MTM <coughs> stuff. So this is the brand new Visual Studio 2013 Ultimate, which not many hands went up when we mentioned this, so this will be an interesting little preview as well. So I'm going to open up our project, which I've opened before, the Fabricant Call Center. And what I want to do is I want to take a test recording that one of the testers has made and I want to turn it into a coded UI test, so something that can run automatically without their input. So that way, the testers have found this thing, they've done some exploratory testing, they've created a test, they've run it a few times, verified that it works, set up a recording, and now it's my job to take that manual stuff out of their hands and get it going again. So when this loads, we've, we can see we've got a fabricantfiber.web.ui test already, so that's where we keep our, our <coughs> UI testing. When that loads, we're going to create a new UI, uh, new coded UI test. I think we asked this before, but is anybody using coded UI tests now? Okay, one and a half, one and a half people. So we, we'll, when um, when you create coded UI tests, do you normally do the recording and you step through the steps and you you create those recordings and um, end up with code? Yeah. Actually, do it the other way around, and so we have a representation of the page and we build the test. So. Right, so you, you do it without the whole UI map recording stuff? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. <coughs> oh, that's interesting. Most Tell people. Telerik Suite does that too. You can just build the <coughs> object model with Telerik Suite? Okay. You just go through the UI, you click on it, and then it creates an automated test file. Yeah, so the Telerik one works pretty much the same way um, as, you know, as the way that, that the uh, Microsoft one does. They try to do a little bit more stuff that's smart around actually selecting items in your web pages and your applications, but essentially it's, it's more or less the same kind of behavior, same way it works. All right, so we've loaded now. I'm going to create a new coded UI test. So I'm going to add a coded UI <coughs> test. And when that comes up, it's going to give me two options. It's going to give me the ability to record an action and edit the UI map and do all that kind of stuff. So record what I want to do. But there's already a recording. A test has already done this for me. So I'm going to use an existing action recording. So I'm going to choose that. And I want, I want to find a, a work item. Sorry, I want to find a test case that has a recording against it. Now that test case that we just created doesn't have a recording against it yet because we haven't run that test case. We ran an exploratory test, but not a test case. And the difference here is that um, exploratory tests aren't actually work items in TFS at the moment. So I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if that changes soon, but for the moment um, it's a different type of thing, so you can't use those exploratory test cases. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to choose a test case that has a recording. Anything that doesn't have a recording will give you this little red no-go sign because there's nothing it can work from. So I'm just going to choose this guy. And what we get from that is exactly the same as if we tried to record this ourselves. So we've got a UI map open website, click on a ticket, UI address and search bar equals, and this is actually a data driven test case as well. So there's a parameter in this test case with different names. 
Um, so we're going to grab the person and we're going to uh, do item, which I'm not sure exactly what that was. So there's a test step in that test case called item. So these are named pretty well. You can kind of understand what's going on. One thing it doesn't do though is it doesn't add an assertion. Because when, when you run a test case, it's really up to the tester to see whether something worked or not. You know, it's not going to record whether you saw what you expected to see. So we have to add an assertion. And the way we do that is we revert back to what we were doing before. We generate code. So that's going all the way up the top. Try and do that a better way. So we generate code for coded UI test. And we will use the build up rather than using an existing recording. And this, if you guys have played with the coded UI test stuff, this will be familiar to you. You've got your UI map and, and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to launch Internet Explorer because the recording works a lot better. And I'm going to go to our application, which is VS 2013 SSW uh, cloud app.net. And I'm going to go to the reports page. Let's pretend that this is that one because it's an easy one to grab. And I'm going to have a look in here. So this one is a control type. It's a custom one. It's technology and so on. So what you do here is you'd, you'd filter this stuff out. You'd work out where you are and do it exactly the same way. Set up an assertion to say, I want to make sure that in this object, this document is, sorry, we don't want document. What do we want? We want custom item, it's ID is, bad example, but ID is one, for example. So you'd find the bit that you wanted to test, you wanted to assert, um, you'd set it up the way it should work, you'd grab that, and then generate the code for your assertion. So assert that I get the right ID. When you add and generate that code, you get exactly what you had before. I'll kill that. And you can see that we've now got this additional assertion that will fail if that ID doesn't exist. Does that make sense? We've got, we've got our test now, and we've got our assertion. So we could run this test. And unfortunately, I don't know what this test does, so we'll try it anyway. We'll run that test, and it should go away. It should run that test. Because we know it fails, it should fail to start off with. And then we fix the bug, we run the test again, and it goes green. So we're using our red green refactor stuff, which is really good. And uh, we have this passing test now. The, dev the uh, tester never has to go and manually run these steps anymore. They can do it um, automatically. Does it capture uh, jQuery errors? If there's a conflict and all that. And so, does it capture jQuery errors? Yeah, for example, uh, you click on a button that a div was supposed to show up, it didn't. So, and you can usually see it in the like Chrome, yeah. you know, inspect element. It will say whatever something value is not defined method or something, you know. So if there's yeah, so if there's an error on your web page, as long as you can navigate to that item, um, you know, using coded UI, and there's a lot that coded UI can do to navigate to these properties you can test what it is. So if there was an error that popped up and you wanted to test that there was no such element on your page which had a class of error, for example, then yeah, you can do that. You can tell it to wait, you can tell it to check for these things and make sure there's nothing there. So there's a lot you can do. That recording tool though is a little bit limited in what happens. So you can get a bit of control by editing this UI map <coughs> to choose for this custom item that I had. Here's how it finds it. It uses the search properties to find out you know, how to find that one. So it's looking for a custom control type. It's looking for a tag name of header. Looking for ID being nothing and so on. So it runs through these to try and find that control. So you can customize all this stuff. But it is a little bit clunky. This whole UI test method is a little bit clunky. If you want to drop down to the code, you're, you're more than welcome. This is just code that's generated. So that's pretty cool. So the, the story here really is that your tester runs through, creates a test, they record what they're doing, and then the developer can take that action out of their hands so they don't have to do it anymore. Can anyone see themselves doing this? Moving on to recorded tests by the tester who has that expertise, and then the developer picking it up and doing that work? 
Yeah, a few hands. Excellent. <coughs> so <coughs> we did that, I'm just running through. We added that coded UI test, we used an existing recording. We chose a test case that had a recording against it and we got our code with the exception of our <coughs> assertion. So everything that was done, don't have to code that. We can use the assertion tool, use that coded UI test recording tool to set assertions on these pages. And then we get this new assertion one. So now this test has something to, to work out whether it's passed or failed. And from that point on, we have that coded UI test. So again, the idea is to get the devs and, working to, the devs and testers to work together to go towards this common goal of you know, a test that can be run automatically um, and the devs you know, can help them with that with that task, not having to do it again. And it saves the testers time. The other thing is, because this is code, you can include this test as part of your build. So you can run coded UI test as another step after your build and after your deployment. Um, it goes a little bit further than that as well, and you can run it, run it in lab environments, which we'll get to a little bit later. But you can actually have these defined in a build and then defined in lab environments. <coughs> so you can say, run this coded UI test, not just in the build server, but also on a, another machine maybe sitting in the cloud running <coughs> a different OS um, with, a, with a different environment. Really. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff you can do here that you wouldn't have been able to do so easily otherwise. Cool. So I might hand back to Adam. So we're looking at testing an MTM. Again? Sorry, just a, just a question on that. When you've automated a test in code, um, how is that visible to the testers? Ah, so there is, yeah, so the question was when you are uh, automated test, how is that visible to the testers that you have automated it? Um, I'll go back to the VM. Where's the VM? I can never find these things. That one. Cool. So in the VM, in we'll go back to MTM. You can see in this test here, if we go back to our plan, this test we've got. A tester can edit, edit this and there's an automation status in there. So at the moment it's not automated. If they wanted this automated, they could say they want it to be automated, have it as planned. The developer then can have a look and see all the test cases that they want automated. They can do the automation and set it up with this associated automation. So you can't do this from MTM, but from Visual Studio, there's an ellipsis here and you can choose a test case point to the assembly that has the test case, choose the test case name um, and the type of test it is and things like that and say this is, a, this is associated with an automation now. So the testers can see that directly. Does that answer the question? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if you're doing a barrage of testing and, and typically you, you, is there any way of just starting to record all these things there and then at the point where you go, oh, now I've got a bug because something doesn't work go backwards to the steps when you started and just replay that rather than having to do one test at a time? So in terms of you know going back a whole lot of steps and go back to where that error started when you're raising a bug to get that recording, um, the recording steps will all be recorded when you do that <coughs> test run. If the developer, if there's a whole lot that aren't relevant, then the easiest thing to do is that for the developer. But I guess to make it easier in the long run, it'd be good if the tester could run through those steps that they do in the test case and just record those things that make that test fail. They're gonna make the developer's job easier because the developer knows they can just use that recording now. It's got everything in it and that's all. Um, and the tester you know, knows that what they've given is the right thing. This is distinct as well from the exploratory testing. Um, exploratory testing just tracks everything you do until you say, I wanna raise a bug or create a test case in which case it puts the steps in. You don't actually get this kind of action recording from an exploratory test yet, probably. Um, but you do get a test case out of it which shows how to reproduce that problem. So then from there, the tester can go and do, an, do a recording and hand it over to the developer. Does that make sense? I think so. I'm looking for a very selfish point of view from the tester rather than the developer. You know? mm -hmm. Often you want to 
test and, and, and it's a free flowing thing, trying things. And then all of a sudden you can find some ways if you want to sort of try and break this thing there. And rather than having to set up, oh, I'm going to do one test case, you want to be recording this thing. Yeah. And if there's a problem, go, okay, now I've broken it, replay the bit that I just did. So what you can do with the exploratory testing is you have all of these steps. If you maybe notice five or six different things, you can create a bug and then parse down those steps to just the ones you, you care about, create that bug, create a test case from there, say, right, there was another one later on as well, create a new test case, and that'll be instead of steps three to five, it's steps nine and 10, create another test case there. So these are the test cases you're automating, I guess, rather than the session. Um, so they could keep doing that testing, raise a whole lot of test cases from them, and then mark them to be automated so the developer can, can go and do that. There was another question? Yeah, so my question was about, can this work for desktop applications as opposed to web? Yes, it can. So coded UI tests, coded UI tests can work with web and with desktop applications as so well. Is it, is it specific to .NET based technologies or it even works with other it's, It works with .NET, yeah. Uh, All right, so the question was, does it work with uh, .NET applications or any Windows applications? So it works with .NET applications and anything running in Windows. All it needs is the ability to find a control and it uses Windows handles to do that. So if it can find a control, if it's got a Windows handle, which pretty much everything in Windows does, then yes, it can find that control. So it's not limited to certain types of applications, really. Yeah. The second question was around, when you run as a part of the automated test case, now does it have the ability to create a bug automatically before it finds something wrong? Uh, so if you have an automated test case, will it raise a bug automatically? No, but the test case will fail, so the, so the developer or the build quality and so on will go down. So it, it becomes very visible that there's a problem. So you can quite easily from that say, I need a new bug. But no, it doesn't create them automatically. Yeah, there was a question up here too. Uh, can we set priorities for these test cases, priorities? Can you set priorities for the test cases? Um, you can, that's that guy there. But honestly, this is the test team thing. So they might have a whole suite of tests. They might have them sectioned into groups and so on um, and run them however they want. So we have one per sprint to test everything. They might have five per sprint and they're different priorities. The test, sec test cases themselves have different priorities. So yeah, they can, they can manage their own process however they want. Yeah. We might move on because well, let's, let's get feedback on what they thought. Yeah, so, so what, what did you think of the coded UI? Most people thought there were a handful of people who thought they were pretty good. Coded UI tests? Yeah. I think the preparation, um, I, I don't even know what those, those five things, that, the five groupings of things, like you had test, there's a big bunch of tests, and then inside that you had lots of like testy things, and then inside the testy things, then there was like lots of tests and then inside that then there were items and it seemed that look I don't know I don't use this tool and it just seems to me that man you're making the guys do a lot of thinking before you get around to the point of actually testing something I'm sure grouping it like project one project two project three makes sense but that was like a, to get to this you went through oh I'm going to create one of these now I'm going to do something else okay and so the feedback well, it wasn't really a question, it was just no, a just comment that saying that you've got to know test suites, test plans, test step, and test cases, test steps. And there's too much thinking to do before you do it. I would say, yeah. if you're, you're a developer, the very first time you're coding, you've got to know about namespaces and classes and methods true. and field. There's a lot of things before I can just type. Yeah. You know, basically, testers want to organize things so that they can reuse bits like that. They want to have one that just logs on automatically, so you don't need to have those same bits every time. So um, it, once you've done it a few times, the first time, of, of course, there's a lot of terms. But this is just organizing bunches of work into different ways. Right, fair enough. So it's not that bad. All right. One more question, sorry. Uh, so you testers are doing exploratory testings, and some of the inputs are, you know, coming from off the screen. 
uh, and somehow uh, you as a tester you want to capture you know, that experience and also uh, you know transfer that to the developers. Uh, is Sorry, you can you tell me what you meant by off the screen? Yeah, so uh, well, I had uh, uh, a case where you know uh, there was a reporting page, and users uh, or testers were to you know do some stuff with the uh, phone app, and then some stuff would appear on the screen, and they were reporting bugs that you know some data are not being transferred uh, to the backend. They were reporting bugs that are not transferred <coughs> so, to the so backend. They were, they were doing something on, on, on the phone app. But the the backend, uh, you know, wasn't capturing it. So they were so they were saying that I did this on the app, and then um, but the, right, the so admin side didn't, you know, reflect to it. So I think the the question is, if I am doing something on the client, and those actions aren't going through to the server, and I've got logs on the server to track what's going on, how do I capture that bug? Well, code UI tests will find out everything that happens on the client and there's nothing that happens that code UI test doesn't know about because it's recording every action that's going on in the Windows client. If, if there's other stuff that you're doing that's not being recorded, there's obviously no way to, to capture that with MTS. <coughs> but when you create your test case, if it does give the opportunity to add a step in between. So you're not limited to just what's there. Yeah. You could create your test case and inject a thing saying, now you need to insert a, a page on your phone. In which case, that test case does have that step, it's just not going to be recorded. Okay. Yeah. Those things aren't so great for automation because it's difficult to automate somebody pressing a couple of buttons on the phone. So. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a little way to go. Um, uh, we will have some uh, handouts going out now uh, for uh, this session and be critical and uh, you need that with your menu for um, pizza at the pub if you're going to watch um, the State of Origin. Who wants to see the State of Origin? Gee, no. you're not even Aussie, what do you want to see it for? I like to see Aussies getting it in the face. Alright, okay, <laughs> cool. Yes, no, it'll be a big game tonight. Um, and da Damien is actually a Queenslander. Oh, yes. Yeah, right. So you're sitting at the back. Yes. <laughs> Are you proud to be a Queenslander? Oh, I was born in Tassie, so I'm kind of a Queenslander. <laughs> oh, <laughs> denial. <laughs> He's covering his bases. So I think, I think there's a good chance that probably Queensland will win again. Unfortunately. I am so sick of seeing the yes. flag on the bridge. <laughs> did, did you know, this is a little fact for you, did you know nobody has ever pasted a, face, a Facebook status message saying, yay, New South Wales has won the series? Because Facebook was only invented in like <laughs> less, than, less than nine years ago. That's uh, cruel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyway. So anybody here not sold on co coded UI tests? That they weren't really sold and wouldn't use it. Gee, you guys are. Yes, they. Hardly anybody got a couple of half hands, but nobody said I wouldn't use it because there are a lot of teams that evaluate this and won't use it because they feel it's too fragile. They're going to break too much, and that's what you've got to really be aware of. You know, it's not easy for a tester to testers can't maintain the broken tests because they need some development skills. It's really a matter of working very closely testers and devs and even then it's hard because they're fragile. They're not like unit tests that aren't so fragile. <coughs> all right, so, all right, so testing with MTM requires Visual Studio, okay, or MTM. Uh, it's a kind of a large installation. It is Windows only. And the UI could be could be better. I have been pleading with the team for some years now to change that MTM IE, you know, the blue screen, the, the UI to be a ribbon. I think a ribbon based thing would be much better. You can see the TFS team went and released the requirements gathering feature in what tool? The require the storyboarding tool in what what tool? You guys all know about the storyboarding tool, I hope. PowerPoint? Yes, in PowerPoint, thank you. So, that storyboarding tool, 
the Microsoft released for VAs essentially um, was done using this tool and then they can um, do stuff like this and this is got a ribbon interface it's quite easy I think to a degree that that UI in um, that we that we use for testers is a little bit unorthodox and so it creates a little bit of friction so I've been asking them but anyway I'm not whinging too much anymore and I'll tell you why because we now have testing in the web this is brand new in 2013 this is uh, a big shift um, it appears that the TFS team are putting a lot of resources into this testing hub on the web and uh, what you can do is go to it you you can install update 2 and you will have this on the server and, or Visual Studio or, or TFS 2013 has taken this further or you can get it today in the cloud which is already on 2013 so basically you can manage your suites and your test cases in web access the whole thing so you don't need to get people to install this obstacle this big fat client now if they have installed the big fat client it will give them more you have still have um, the ability for that but you can pretty much run all the tests using this web test runner all right so uh, let's go ahead and do that I am just going to close this baby down save uh, well. yeah, well. okay in case I get in trouble all right, and I'll kill this. Yep. Like a typical developer, so yes. Typical developer leaves all their junk around. All right. So what I am going to do, um, I'll come here. So now you can, you'll see this test hub. See this test hub. This thing, and you'll see there's a star, which basically means it's in preview or beta or whatever. It still works and it's there to use, we use it um, at the moment. Um, and we can do what we want to do in here. We can, uh, do you want me to do anything in particular? Yeah, well why don't we run that same test again? Okay, all right. So I could come in here, I could create a test plan and go through that stuff. It looks like, right, it's, there we go, this guy, there it is. We added him before and I've got to do this. So I could open that up and have a look at what's inside, check there's acceptance criteria, <laughs> or I could do exactly what um, what we did in the rich client before, but we can do it in the web now. So I'll just click run. What's going to happen now? Oh, that, this is uh, not going to work. So we have to come here, always allow pop-ups, and then we'll come back here and we'll do that again. And it'll put that thing on the side, but it's a web thing. And then I'm going to go ahead and do whatever it tells me to do. So, um, is that a, that didn't really resize things. No, it didn't work. No, no it didn't resize it. So I'm going to try, should I try that in IE? Because it resizes things in IE. Uh, pretty certain. Let's just try that again. Oh, don't tell me this. I am just going to try that naive because I think I have a different experience here. So I am going to um, run. I run that. I'm going to. Oh gosh, the same stuff always allow. <coughs> All right, there we go. And I was uh, incorrect. It's the same experience. My mistake, sorry. So, all right. So uh, I need to click the document, whatever it says. I need to click this to see what is the uh, acceptance criteria. So that doesn't work. So I'm going to have to, uh, oh, I can't get to that either. So I'd have to come back here to look at my acceptance criteria acceptance criteria oh that's my test case great this is your test case yes um, can I get to the actual I would have to go and look at the the other tabs so let me just 
need to go to links. Go back to the work item. And there's a product backlog item. That's hard work to get to. That. There's a, a link actually on there. I think if you close that on the main page, the top it has requirements. All right, so let me just try that. Whereabouts? Uh, go back one more. Sort of oh, there. Sorry, I didn't see it. You're right, that would have been a quicker way of getting to it. So, there we go. Navigate to the reports page, which shows stats for last month. So, I'm going to come in here. I will see does it show stats. And obviously, you come down here and you go, Yes, yes. Now I have to do type XXX in the custom control. It gives me an error. I'm going to say fail. And then I'm going to say, I can't see that and um, what you're missing from this is the ability to do beautiful rich screen captures and things yeah, like that. You can do that. Plus X2 create button. Oh right. Add comment. So no, add attachment. Yeah, add attachment. So the difference here is you can't do it they can't send you a screenshot, can't do some screenshotting from uh, IE. So you kind of left to do your own screenshots and your own recording if that's what you want to attach. But that's not that's not an experience. No, but you can't you can't do that in a web. You can't get a browser to take a screenshot of your um, OS, for example. Um you well sorry HTML5 you probably could screenshot yes. stuff. But you'd be limited to the browser contents, which is fine probably. But if you're testing a Windows app, for example, can't do it. Yeah. So it's, it, you're going to be falling back to text mm -hmm. if you think that's okay. May is, uh, did you want to show anything else here? Uh, not really. You can create a bug as well, yep. exactly the same way. Okay. Version as there are no screen shots. Okay. That's in my opinion anyway. All right. Anything else? <coughs> Save and close. Save and close. Yep. Yep. And you can see that's a, that's a basically a fail because one one step failed. All right. But that's that doesn't mean you should be upset with the web. Still use the web, and you'll see this. Run using the client. I'm just going to resize this just to see how it fixes things up. It says, um, "Do you want to use Test Manager?" And this is the beauty. So this will fire this open, resize this. It, I thought it would fix this up actually. And then it says, start the test. Now we should now use the power in create an action reporting. Now the average test is not going to know what does create action reporting mean. And that's going to do two things. One, it's going to allow the tester to um, replay the bits that they've just gone through. And secondly, if they hit a problem, it's going to give the developer everything they did. So it helps both sides. So I don't know why it's not checked. So we do that and it's saying the test recording session has started. Now we can do click that in the document. So I will click whatever it wanted me to do in the document. Okay, and that passed, so I click that. Um, click the document, yes, that worked. And type that in the, and I'm going to say, I can't do that. What are you talking about? So then we come into our rich um, bug reporting. And where is my screen capture? Oh, by the way, if all the te all the steps are down here. If I wanted to say, look, just uh, don't worry about that mouse hover. I can right click and delete that. So I can clean that up a bit. And um, now, my screen capture, I think that's it. Add a screenshot. And I can screenshot that. It'll throw that in. I can click that. I can use the advanced features of paint. <coughs> okay, close that. And uh, now, if I was, so I'll just um, finish that in, the, in that test. But I could do this and replay, play all. 
So I'll just go through and do those steps again. Oh, I didn't do anything, did I? Really. I didn't do anything <laughs> visual. I should have thought about that. But that would go through and open up all the windows I just did. I should actually do something more intelligent. Use, use Chrome or something. So I will just, um, I'll reset all that. You want to reset the test? So you can see this is a lot more richer at this point in time. But you can see where the direction is going. All this functionality is likely to be thrown into the web. Um, and so I'm going to start the test. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to go press Control T. I'm going to go to Google. And I'm going to type Adam. And um, now I'm going to end that test. And there, there's all my, it's all been recorded there. You can see down there. End that test. Now, I'll just close that. Now, play again. Play all. And that should do all those same things. And I have no idea why it isn't. So, the first thing Probably it's looking it, for that custom control it's looking it's for changed windows. And I've closed, you're right. Let me just try that again. I should not have closed Google. Let me just try that again. So, we're going to play all again. Oh gosh. Okay, let's try that again. Play all. Click Google screen, it says click custom control. No, All right, no. let me just do this once more. Uh, yeah, delete the first two steps and you'll be yes. sweet. I can't delete it because I'm not editing it. Uh, bugger. But yes, if I deleted those first two, and then it would order, automatically get in there. Right. And I cannot delete it because I'm not editing that. I should have done it when I, when I was recording it, before I saved it, essentially. When I ended the test, I saved it. All right, anyway. That's how that works, and that seems to be the direction going forward from Microsoft. Do you know, if, can you, um, in, the, in the TFS sort of window, uh, the, the middle window? In the middle window, yes, that, that window, yes. You know how you associated a, an automated test with that? I mean, I don't know whether it's been saved up there now, but do you know if you can then kind of trigger the automated test? So, do you want to repeat what he's asking? So, the question I think was if you apply automation to that test, yeah. can you uh, trigger that automated test run? And the answer is, I'm not 100% sure, but I think no. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a difference between a, a coded test which runs those same steps and the test case itself and its recording. Okay. But 90% sure. But the coded UI test should run through the build? It should do whatever it so if you yeah. kind of put the test in. Yes, yeah. Uh, yes, it will. <coughs> so the coded UI test will run on the build if you have if you have that as part of the automation. So yes, it's part of your solution really, or it's part of a test project though. So it doesn't really refer so much to this test case. Yeah. It's just kind of there's a link there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So we're done with that. We are. Yeah. So all right, we're going to hurry up. Um, so as you saw, we, we saw the web test stuff in web access. You can add test plans, right click to add test suites, create new tests over here, and then run in the browser or run using MTM. That requires the big installation. Okay. But as you can see, testers can pretty much do everything in the browser. Um, they do this, they can pass, fail, or pause tests in the browser. Um, they can Click pass, click fail, add comments, fail the test, upload an image in, in Damien's language. All right. Uh, they can press create bug, etc. Now here's the sexy bit. You can have your testers working in other types of OSs.
I'm not familiar with this OS. What is that, <laughs> Damien? I think that's uh, Apple. All right. Okay. All right. Cool. So a summary of the testing in web access. Before I tell you my thoughts, um, what are your thoughts? Do you like this? Who, who would have their testers using it? Okay. Wow. Eight percent. Who would not use this? Nobody. A one. <laughs> I don't think so. You, you prefer the rich client? No, I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a consultant, recruitment consultant. Oh, so you don't care. No. <laughs> All right, I don't have to worry about any of this. All right, cool. All right, so um, test case management in the web is pretty good. You can run the tests from the browser, any browser, and that's a big consideration for some clients. Big deal. And no need to install MTM, so it makes things much cheaper as well. Right, so just on that, does that mean no license required? Do you have as many as you? Well, there's no. TFS, so you don't need to have an advanced premium license to use that. Yeah. I think if the test is still using that functionality, they need a cal, so they do need a license. But it doesn't have. They don't have to have the MTM installed. They don't have to have that full suite. I don't believe. But you might have to refer to the licensing stuff. Yeah. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. But they they clearly need to have a cal. Um, I I'm not sure Microsoft have even announced what how they're going to do all this. Um, so I want to talk to you about stakeholder feedback, um, and then I would love Damo just to add a little bit more of Salim. So I'll just fly through this. Um, if you want informal feedback from someone not in your Scrum team, you need them to have a look. You need to get Bob from logistics who knows all about how we need it, Mary from legal to have a look through it. Then you can't get them to install MTM and you probably can't even ask them to, you can't even send them a link to that test tab and ask them to do that. They're not going to do that. That's not how they give feedback. They'll have a look through it. Give me the link. I'll send you some emails. So I want to talk to you about how you do that part. So how do you guys do that today? Anybody got a solution for that? You know, somebody who's not a tester, but you need them to have a look through and give you feedback. What's your solution, TJ? We use a um, um, Kanban tool, and it's... Does every it answer that you give have something to do with Kanban? <laughs> yeah, like your SharePoint. Uh, <laughs> it has a column ready to test with the date, so they know what to test at that time. They, they open up, and there's a list of scenarios, do this, do that, do that. If they pass, they check it. If it doesn't, they take a screenshot, and they add it from there, and they move it to bug area. And, and what tool are you using for this? Uh, for informal stuff, for quick stuff, we use Trello. Other than right. that, we use uh, in-house. Right. So you're giving your develop your your stakeholders a link to Trello. Well, for the big enterprises, we use in-house built ones. So right. We have a test up. Okay. Well, let me show you what we're going to do. We're going to encourage you not to use email for this process, not to need a meeting and a demo. I'm not saying you don't need it, but this is one where they need to actually look through themselves and, and have some quiet reflection. Uh, we don't need to be involved in this. Let, let them have a look. So we want you to encourage them to use the feedback tool. This feedback tool is, um, let me just show you. I will come here. I'm going to close this guy and I'm going to close this guy as well because the person doesn't have any of that. And they just come to the home tab and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask, I, sh I should ask you, you to send this to me, but anyway, I'll just, how am I going to send this to myself? I'll try. How about? You do the things there, and I'll do them over here. And oh, okay, and then you'll send it to my inbox or something. Okay, so I would select a stakeholder, which would be myself, which would be very weird. But And then I'd send it to all the different people. All they need is a live ID, or they need to be in Active Directory. And then I need to give them a link to the app to test, so I'd come over here and I'd click that, and i see I need you to test that. Now, I could, I could send it to a remote machine, I could send it to a client app, an exe, in this case, it's a web app. So I'm just going to click there, and it wants me to type instructions. Instructions. Can you test the reports part? I'm 
just going to see if you can count as many. I'm just, I'm just screwing with you. He's trying to type every character I'm doing. Oh. Okay. What do you want me to do? I want you to um, test if you like the portal, the reports portal. Um, and then give them details. Click XXX and click Y, 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 Y. And then I also want you to uh, comment on the UI navigation. Okay, you'll notice I spelled navigation wrong. And then, <laughs> all right, and then, that, you know, you've got the idea, okay? So I can preview that. I don't know why it says preview, because I can actually edit that. Test if you like the reports portal, TJ. And uh, I can see this stuff. I, I don't know why it's, that's not indented. I'll just indent it. And then I press send. And I won't press send because I, can, I don't even think I can send it to myself, but I can try. I did. All right, so now I just log on to my mail. I, I am now the other person. and that I forgot HTTP yes this is really smart opening your mailbox in front of everyone but anyway <laughs> should have sent to Google Gmail or something alright so here we are it looks like I've never seen this I'm in a VM. Oh, what? I should just. No, I should do. Come out of this and go into my other one, but I'll try it once more. Oh, it shows my mail for a second. Alright, it's just teasing me. So I'll just come here. Uh, I'll try to do it from here. So now I've jumped out of the VM because the VM wouldn't even open my mail. And here's Damien Brady's inviting me. And this is uh, we want your <laughs> feedback for the following items. Gee, you even put the TJ. And you even spelled navigation wrong. Great. Mm. He's got a, all right. So start that. Ah, oh. uh, can you believe this? Can you, I, I just cannot believe this. I cannot click that because OWA is blocked out. And I cannot see what the URL is. Is it dumb? Oh, I know I need it. Huh? Yes. Alright, I can't open that, but I would I'll show you what was gonna happen. I just cannot believe that. Is there a way of stopping that from AWA stop? AWA is would that be a problem for clients too? Yeah, that'll be a problem for clients. It's is terrible. It because Adam and Visual Studio is not trusted? Yes, because this link is an untrusted link because it's not just a URL. It's a it's a thing that's going to open a. Um, it installs an app. It installs a thing. Yeah. That's a real bugger. That's horrible. Anyway, let me just show you what was going to happen. If you could just IM me the link on Skype, then I can do it. The, the link is in the email, I think, at the bottom. Wait for it. If clicking start doesn't. Oh, yeah, thanks. Gee. Gee, well, spot one person. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one per this person like 50 knows what's going on. All right, so I just. Now, how would. Anyway, you come here. Thank you. This would be the experience. And the first time, it's it's another three seconds slower. And actually, I could show it, but that's what it, this is what it ha happens. This installs this rich client thing. And it says, this is what you got to do. You got to click that thing. Oh, this is why I was confused by that other thing. I was getting these two tools mixed up. This resizes everything, as you notice. It opens that and says, can you test the reports part? That is not as many, I, I did more than, than that. So I am going to uh, click test the reports part. So I click the reports. Now I'm, I'm Bob, you know, the boss here. I'm just trying to do what it says. I click this. next after you have launched Yep. All right. So I've clicked that. Do you test? I like that. Yes, I clicked X and I clicked Y and it looks good. 
And, oh, uh, I can do it. Oh, this is more like it. This is more like it. This is much more like so there's it. There's an error over there. And you want to yeah, I clicked that. There's my screenshot. Of course, I can double click on that. This and use my silly tool here. Or, or I could use snag it, but you know they're not going to have that. But you can see I've got that. I I can rate this item. I'll give it one. In addition, I'll go to the next one. Comment on the UI navigation. I'm not typing that. I didn't type that. Anyway, I could I could do this. Well, I'm not really happy with this UI. See the way that it reports that font should be a lot bigger. So this is, I'll just play that. Well, I'm not really happy with this UI. See the way that it reports that font should be a lot bigger. All right, so there's, so that's, that's the tool that you give the feedback, the, the bosses. And, and what's the beauty of this for a developer? The beauty is that now I don't have to triage all the um, emails that came in or whatever, or however they did it, because this is going straight into TFS. Straight into TFS. Plus, you can see that it, they're fairly rich reports. Okay, so um, next. I'll give that, that the UI, I'll give it four. It looks pretty nice. So I submit and close, and that's the <coughs> end of my feedback for that particular tool. I like that. That's less onerous on the person you're asking. You, yes. You've got to be nice to them. You're asking their opinion, so you don't want to give them a, a lot of burden. This yes. is easy to use. So let's have a look at that again. You click request feedback. <coughs> it will send, it will ask you for some stuff. You fill it in. You tell them what you want them to test specifically. They will receive this. They'll click start your session, or in this case, click that link. Uh, that will be the first time experience. And then they've got all this. So they can do screenshots with markup. They can give ratings. Lots of options for feedback. Pretty nice tool, if you ask me. Um, in addition, you should put a couple of these um, live tiles on your portal that shows you how much feedback is coming in from the different people, from your different stakeholders, and um, then you're in business. <coughs> um, when you've, that feedback's come back, you click this button if you want to turn that feedback into a work item or into, a, into a, an item on the backlog. It's already a work item. It's called a feedback response work item. And here it all is. And so um, you choose the work item type, product backlog, and then you're in there. So I have a question for you. Who really like that tool for their stakeholders? Everyone. Who didn't like and would keep doing it the way they do it today? No one. That's surprising to me. Hold on, yes, TJ. Well, it says that the first time experience showed that there's a Visual Studio installer going on. Would yes. that be a problem for the enterprise uh, users where they cannot install really nothing? Uh, Question being, will that feedback tool installation be an issue for yeah. enterprises where you can't install stuff? Uh, probably. You probably just need admin permissions to install that. So that that feedback tool, um, you can install that independently. There was a link in that email for install the feedback tool if you don't have it. Yeah. So somebody could sort that out in your in your organisation if they if they wanted that that functionality. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. All right, yes. Is there a web-based version of this feedback tool? Is there a web-based version of the feedback tool? No, it's, <laughs> it's requires that. Yeah. So I'm going to give you my thoughts, um, and you guys are a very pro on it. I don't, can't believe we've got 100% of the room. I think it's good that you can ask anyone for feedback and get nice, rich feedback. It's automatically added to TFS, one step from feedback to a pro backlog item. But there's a couple of things. The first thing that I hesitate, and by the way, we've had some clients using this and we haven't had um, negative feedback. We've only had good feedback plus um, uh, we haven't had those installation problems that you guys just um, thought about. But there's two things that kind of I'm iffy on. When these people, these you know 
lawyers or the boss or whatever giving feedback on that thing, they're used to giving feedback. They're important people in the company. They know how they're used to do it. They take this screenshot, they put in this email, they send the email the way they want it, etc. They're used to it. You're now asking them to change the way that they work just to report feedback on your product as opposed to everyone else. So there's a workflow um, hump, and I, I, I'm, I hesitate. Plus, if they hit a nasty bug, you don't get the richness that you get with MTM. Now, obviously, those type of people aren't going to install MTM. But if you could get them to install MTM, you would get more. But you won't be able to. That's just, they're just the thoughts. So I guess I'm not as, as pro as you guys. I'm, I'm still pro. You wouldn't introduce them that early in your beta process. You'd be, you're the product. Of, you're asking their opinion from Bob from sales. Mm. You know, does this work with your business process? Yes, that's you're, right. You're not expecting the product to crash and, and burst into flames. You'd hope that it wouldn't. You'd bring them in later in the cycle, I would imagine. No. So it's not a, not a terrible the, the, early, the earlier you get feedback and the more often you get feedback, the more times they're going to hit something. And you're now going to have the same repro issues that we just talked about that we want to solve. So that's, that's my, my thinking, my hurdle. Anyway, one environment isn't enough. And I'm going to get you to walk through this. Yep, sure. So, um, one thing as well, and this is a little bit of an intro to lab management, it's especially with the web, it's not always good enough to test it in IE on your dev machine or on your build server. So, um, this has kind of grown as a requirement as a result of this whole movement towards bringing your own device. So, I know at SSW, most of the devs have their own laptop. You know, it's their thing that they want to use. Um, Adam doesn't like it sometimes, particularly when you've got things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, the developers and the other guys at, at um, workplaces often want to use their own equipment, and it's much easier to do these days. Even iPads and things like that. Adam walks around with a couple of iPads in his hand most of the day. So um, it's not enough to test it in one environment. Now, Lab Manager in the past used to be a little bit restricted in that there were some pretty complicated Hyper-V setups. and. Um, SCVMM um, requirements and you had to you basically had to spend a lot of money and get hardware and infrastructure and all that kind of stuff to get this stuff running and 99% of companies did not want to do that for a small amount of benefit the maintenance on them as well you've all you've got this extra infrastructure and so on so um, that's changed a little bit with the latest changes to lab management now they let you test in multiple environments a lot easier so there's two main changes here one is standard environments, uh, so you don't have to rely on Hyper-V and you don't have to rely on the SCVMM stuff anymore. Standard environments means that you can point at a machine that's currently sitting on your network and say, use that as my test machine. So you could keep a machine over there in the corner with Windows XP and IE6 on it, install a couple of tools so that you can deploy across to that for testing, and that now becomes one of the environments you can test on using Lab Manager. It's a lot, lot lower barrier to entry. The other change is Azure. So until very recently, you could spin up a, a VM in Azure and um, you know get it running and so on. But if, if you'd stopped it, they'd still charge you a little bit to keep that VM there. Really recently, they changed it so if the VM is stopped, you don't get charged at all. So what you can do is you can set up 30 VMs with different environments. And when you do want to run a test against one of them, you spin it up, run your tests, and then shut it down. You can do that with PowerShell as well. So you can do that as part of your build process. So in Lab Manager, which is, um, if you open MTM, this little drop down up here, you can flick that and change to Lab Manager. I'm just going to skip through these slides a little bit because we're out of time. Um, so you can now choose a standard environment. Um, and set up your machines and all that kind of stuff. In Azure, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that you can do straight from their gallery. So this VM that we've been using today, the Visual Studio 2013, <coughs> if you have, um, if your live ID is tied to an MSDN account, then you get $100 to $200 worth of Azure usage free every month. So it wouldn't cost you anything. But you can go create a new virtual machine choose from the gallery and choose Visual Studio 2013 Preview and it will 
uh, uh, will provision a machine with Visual Studio 2013 preview on it immediately. Well, it takes a little while to get it going. But it doesn't cost you anything, it doesn't cost you any time. You're just clicking a couple of buttons and it's there. So that's what we've been using tonight. It did not take very long to set those things up. So you can do the same thing with these environments. You might want to test on an older Windows server or on a Windows XP machine. So you can spin up these VMs really easily with Azure. It doesn't cost you anything until they're running. So yeah, there's a few different options there. Um, and of course you can do an empty install and install whatever you want on these things, as long as you have licenses. Um, you can also add these to the build. So this is um, 2013 UI. It's nice. Uh, my uh, sorry, nice uh, Team Explorer. They've changed it so it's a little bit cleaner and a li little bit more metro. Um, and there's a lab a lab default uh, build template. So this is how you set it up to run in a lab. They've already got this build template in there. And then by clicking on the little um, ellipses there, you can go through a wizard where you set up your environments that you want to use, the build you want to use, where do you want to deploy it to, what test you want to run, all that kind of stuff as well. So it's pretty straightforward doing all this stuff. So what do you guys think? Has, ever, has anybody tried to use lab management before? Have you thought about using it but then realized what was involved and decided not to? No? All right. A lot of people put their hands up with that one. They thought about it, yeah, it'd be great to be able to do these things, but then the, the barriers to entry are really hard. So these days, I'd encourage you to get back into it. It's a lot easier than it used to be. So yeah, again, environments can be set up for any machine you have on your network at all. You can run the tests on those environments, and you can put those tests in the build and run them automatically. So you can see we've started getting all the way from these exploratory tests where the, you've got a tester clicking around, creating a coded UI test from the test recording, putting that coded UI test in as part of your build definition, deploying that to a lab so you can run that test, that coded UI test in a different environment and it's all seamless all the way from, from initial clicking around blindly all the way through to this completely repeatable um, test that runs in the, all these different environments which is pretty cool. Getting a lot better at that. Who thinks that's cool? I think it's amazing. Awesome. Most hands. Excellent. And yeah, Azure for VMs. So, can you show a tiny bit of Selenium? Just so people that <coughs> are using Selenium, because there's only four people in here using Selenium. All right. So that, those coded UI tests, people have used, a couple of people have used those, they said. Um, I'm a web guy <coughs> from that slide at the start, so I like, you know, testing stuff on the web. I know the web, and testing one thing in IE doesn't really cut it for me. I want to do a few other tests, so I'm just going to... Do you need to install the extension? Already done. Uh -huh. Well, I'll explain the extension. There's not much of an extension <coughs> that I have to in install, but... What I'm going to do, I'm just going to create a unit test project. This is just the easiest way to get started. I could do coded UI, but I'm not going to use the coded UI stuff, so I'm just going to create a new unit test project. Um, and I'm going to, the first thing any good developer does when they want to use a third party library is they right click <coughs> and manage NuGet packages. If you're a developer, put your hand up if you're using NuGet. Excellent. That's everybody's hand, pretty much. I, I always hate it when people say, no, no, don't use NuGet. What's NuGet? Anyway. So what I want to do is look at Selenium. So what um, the Selenium guys would know is that uh, Selenium is a way of, it's a, it's a tool really that lets you talk to the browser and to the browser's web page. So you can find controls, you can do things to controls, you can um, even do things as far as changing the browser window size or changing the user agent that gets sent up to the server. So it's really powerful. So I've added Selenium there. And so what I want to do is in this test method, I want to start a, um, I want to test this in Chrome. Chrome's installed here. So um, if it was new, and this doesn't have resharper, which is going to slow me down very slightly. Open QA, Selenium, Chrome, um, Chrome driver. And I just happen to know that, so this is where you need another install. So you need a web driver for Chrome. 
Um, you need a web driver for each of these browsers. And what this is, it's a um, download, which is a, a standalone exe, completely standalone exe. So you could include this in your project, get it to dump to the bin, and then just have it from the bin. But just to make it easy, I've put it in data Adam Kogan. Uh, right, so I'm just telling it where to find that driver, because it needs to do that to run it. Uh, and then I'm going to set a couple of settings as well. Um, I want to manage its uh, window to say, uh, not window, I want to manage its timeout, timeouts. Uh, and tell it to implicitly wait um, 10 seconds. So the problem with um, testing things like Google that uses Ajax and so on. A lot of the time when you tell it to um, to find a control, that control may not exist for a little while. So this is, it's not the most ideal way to do it, but it's definitely a really easy way to do it. Uh, so I'm just gonna say, look, you can wait 10 seconds to find the control that I want you to find. Right, so we've got our browser, we want to go to, uh, Google Australia and in there we want to find the search um, search bar uh, and that is Chrome and there's some awesome find stuff in here so you can find elements by all sorts of stuff now because I'm a developer who likes the web and uses jQuery this is my favorite one by CSS selector so this is exactly the way you'd select something in jQuery. Um, and I just happen to know <coughs> that uh, in this case, there's a name equals Q. So the attribute on the item has a name, which is Q. I could have also done select element by name, but. That's what you see in the query string. Yeah. So, uh, so that should be my search one. And I'm gonna search, I'm gonna send some keys to it. I'm gonna send um, SSW testing. And I'm going to submit that. So you submit the element, not the browser? Yeah, because it's part of the form, that will work fine. I could also find the form element and submit that, but, um, but this works just as well. Um, and then what do I want to do then? I want to find a control after that. So this should be the search results. Uh, and this one's going to test me. So var. Uh, Results equals, so in Chrome, I'm going to find element by CSS selector, and if memory serves me, it's a R class and a anchor. You're right. But the, way you'd, but the way you'd find this, you'd open up Chrome, you do your, do your test, so I'm just going to do it here. I'm going to search for SSW testing, and I'm going to use the dev tools, inspect element, and I can see in here it's an anchor and it's underneath a H3 with a class of R. So that's going to find all of those ones that match. I can test that as well because even though it doesn't have jQuery, it's got selectors, so uh, A. And I can see there's all of these, or well, there's that one there, so that's the first one that I've got. Cool. Um, one thing that is going to break here is I've said to find element, and there might be more than one. So let's make it elements. And then the result I want is the first one. So var uh, first text equals results, first one, and the text that's inside that. That actually does an inner text um, if, you, if you know the web. Finally, an assertion, assert. Uh, is true um, first test starts with and I want it to start with SSW rules just to make sure that we're the first result for that one okay so who's going to be amazingly impressed if this works first time because I am um, the demo gods uh, made some sacrifices earlier so let's give that a go Opens Chrome, types SSW testing, and then did we pass? Let's 
go back here. Test Explorer, successful test. So, um, one thing I should have done is this Chrome quit. Um, so that would have closed Chrome as well, so I could come back. Now there's awesome stuff you can do with this. This is like literally just the surface. So you could do things like send a, send a um, user agent string saying I'm an iPad to the browser, change the browser window to be 800 by 600 or whatever an iPad is, and make sure that it's sending you the right content. Or you could find an element on your page and make sure that it's not visible if you're using responsive design and things like that. Um, if I wanted to change this to Firefox, I'd change that to use the Firefox driver or the IE driver or Android or Safari or IE or whatever. Even remote, which I haven't played with much, but I think you can test on a remote device. So, What are the uh, drivers again? So they, they, they actually run Chrome? Yeah, it's, it's an XE that knows how to talk to Chrome. Um, Firefox doesn't actually need a driver. Firefox has got one built in. You just need to point to Firefox and it can do it itself. Uh, IE needs a driver, Android I think does, Safari probably does. So it's, it's a standard way of talking to a browser that somebody standardized and Selenium talks to that and can offload that. It's like an abstraction around the browser behavior. Mm. Yeah. So there you go, that one's for, test for the coders. Sorry. So thank you, Damon. That um, was good and that uh, brings us to the end. Uh, hopefully you've seen a fair bit of stuff. We talked about Agile. We talked about exploratory testing in MTM, which is the best feature they have in there. You got, you talk, we talked about automated tests using coded UI. We talked about how we can get users on the web without installing MTM. Um, and the feedback tool for stakeholders and a bit of lab management and a bit of bonus um, Selenium stuff. So um, last two things, that's, there are our email addresses and there are our Twitters, uh, happy to receive any emails or if you guys have got good practices um, you, you know there's a series of uh, quality center guys here uh, maybe over at the pub I'd love to know um, what you guys can do that you haven't seen here but hopefully it's been a great night please fill in your emails that's the only price of pizza at the pub emails and your lanyards and we will see you over there thank you great did you get all that we'll take the SSW TV quiz and test your knowledge now